You know, for so long in 2015, Undertale was everywhere, and I actually avoided the game for a long time because of it. I tend to stay out of games that are usually very popular in the indie scene, just in case they're overhyped or oversaturate the market, so I thought I'd wait a little while before I played it, and then really dig into it when things had died down a bit. And 2015, it was pretty much the king of gaming. Everyone was giving it the best game of the year, and everyone thought it was amazing. And it may be a year late, but I think it's about time we saw what all the fuss is about. I mean, so many people were saying it was the best game of 2015. So let's see what we got. By the way, I'm going to spoil pretty much all the main story elements of this game. So, uh, beware of that. If you haven't played the game already, play it first. So the story in this game is that long ago humans and monsters lived together in harmony above the ground, until some sort of conflict of interest caused them to turn on each other. Long story short, the humans won and sealed the monsters below ground, hence the title, Undertale. We play as the androgynous kid who wanders up Mount Ebbett, presumably the point where the monsters were sealed away, and falls down a pit into the underground. That's pretty much it. Okay, let's pick our name and start this off. Oh hello! A flower. Well, he looks like a nice enough guy. Apparently his name is Flowey. Okay. Flowey teaches us the basics of combat. We have a heart symbol that represents our soul, we can move around the keys, and also have some hit points and a love level. You want some love, don't you? Here I'll share some with you. Actually, buddy, I think I'll pass on that one. Is this a joke? Are you brain dead? Hey, I'm not the one trying to smother people with my love, alright? I mean, what do you call them? Friendliness pellets. Alright, here's the thing, mate. There's another word for those. It's called roofies. Oh man, he's angry now. Ow! Ow! Oh look, a goat lady. She's actually really nice. Her name's Toriel, and she helps fend off Flowey, holds her hand through the beginning of the game, sometimes literally, and generally is a good Samaritan looking out for our safety. Oh wait, hold on, I just realised while reading the script, Toriel is like tutorial. Oh yeah! She even tries to set us a good example by teaching us to talk our way out of fights, which is actually one of the unique selling points of this game in general, as technically you don't have to kill anything in the game. Even if enemies attack you, she's all like, Oi mate! Piss off! Yeah, you better run. You have done excellently thus far, my child. However, I have a difficult request of you. I would like you to walk to the end of the room by yourself. Forgive me for this. Oh cool, pressure pad puzzles. To be honest, the puzzles in this game are pretty simple, but overall that's not a bad thing. I mean, they give your brain a nice distraction from the combat, and in an RPG, that's basically the whole reason you have puzzles, just to make your mind wander a bit and refresh from all the fighting. Whoa there, partner. Who said you could push me around? A talking rock. Sure, why not? Okay, and now there's something blocking my path. Kinda looks like a ghost. Let's try and move it. Oh, hello there, um... Napster bloke. He's ever so sad. The thing is, if you talk to him and try to cheer him up, he makes a top hat out of his tears? Sure, why not? And moves on. Oh look, and Toriel's here, and she's prepared a room for me to stay in. And she made me butterscotch pie! Oh, she's bloody lovely. Okay, better go now. Uh, Toriel, where are you going? You want to leave so badly? Prove yourself. Oh. So now we have to fight Toriel. 
She flings fireballs at you about mercy, but you can't actually lose the fight unless you run into her projectiles. If your health gets really low, she actually avoids hitting you and looks away, and you can talk your way out of the fight if you use the mercy button. After a little fight, Toriel encourages us not to look back, and gives us a big old hug. Next we exit the ruins and go through a foreboding forested area. Behind us we can hear footsteps in the snow, and menacing tension is tangible in the air. And then just as we come to a bridge over a gap in the road, a shadowy figure approaches us. Sans, a lovable wisecracking skeleton who tells us to hide behind a nearby conveniently shaped lamp. Seamless. Then his brother Papyrus runs in, a self-described dashing hero who wants to capture a human to become a member of the Royal Guard. Too bad he's utterly useless. These two act as the comedic relief of the story for the most part, and are brilliantly at odds with each other's personality extremes. We also find more interesting monsters for some reason mainly dog-themed, and stumble onto the town of Snowdin. Here we get our first glimpse at monster civilization and start to question why these creatures are even labelled as monsters. Most seem placid enough and don't really offer any threat, and we start to bring in the question of who really is the monster in this game. At the end of the town we face off against Papyrus and can even go on a date with him? Sure, why not? Next up we enter a dark area known as Waterfall and run into a menacing knight. It chases us through the area until we get lost in the garbage, meet an old turtle thing, fight a crazed dummy, check in at Nastablook's house. And we also stumble into a village inhabited by some cat creatures called Temi, and also get a chat with a dancing mushroom. Mushroom dance, mushroom dance, whatever can it mean? It means you've lived a life of sin. And finally we face off against the knight itself. Undyne, who is a blue, eye-patched, red-head, fish lady... thing. Sure, what? Then in the next area we run into a dinosaur weeaboo scientist called Alphys and a human killing machine robot, Metaton. We see a budding romance between the Royal Guards blossom, do some puzzles, fly a jetpack, go through an area called The Core, and defeat Metaton in some sort of disco dance number, and reach Asgore, King of the Monsters, house. Here we learn a bit about Asgore's motivations for fighting the humans, his past with Toriel, and what his plans are with the protagonist. Supposedly with the human soul and his collection of six other souls he's been collecting, he can destroy the human-made barrier keeping the monsters underground and lead his people to the surface. Even Sans returns to judge us for our actions and explains that experience actually stands for execution points and is a way to quantify the pain we have inflicted for our own love, an acronym of Level of Violence. Then we face the king under the mountain himself, Asgore. He's actually a really nice guy, I mean, he's watering the flowers, wanting to offer us tea, and make sure more than once to remind us of the upcoming battle to make sure we're all ready. Then as we head to the barrier, a strange light fills the room. Twilight is shining through the barrier. It seems your journey is finally over. You're filled with determination. Human, it was nice to meet you. Goodbye. So we have to battle Asgore. He can't be talked down and there's no room for mercy. He's a pretty cool endgame boss with a lot of variety in his moveset, but eventually after enough hits, we beat him. As he kneels in defeat, Asgore tells us how his son's death led him to destroy all the humans who fell into the underground. And with the souls of seven humans, he would break the barrier and free his people, but confesses he doesn't want to hurt people or have power and only wishes for his people to have hope. And as we show the king one last mercy, Flowey strikes. And after consuming the six human souls that are there, crashes the game. Then as we reload the game in the save file, something seems a bit off. Well, this looks fair. 
Also, what is that? So Flowey becomes whatever the hell this monstrosity is, and we helplessly try to stop him. After a few scuffles with each individual soul's power, we call out for help and draw upon the soul's strength to fight back. Then as we defeat Flowey, the cheeky git reloads his save file. Oi mate! Piss off! And proceeds to repeatedly kill us over and over again until the souls rebel against it and take its powers away. Then as it lays defeated in the abyss, we get to choose to kill it or show mercy. And if you continually choose mercy, it gives us a challenge. Complete the whole game without killing anything. Yeah, I mean, after that display of a final boss, I'm pretty sure I could take care of anything from now on in my life. I'm scarred for life! Okay, just so I don't repeat myself too much, we do all the stuff I've already mentioned again, this time without any casualties at all, and get to play a special segment in Alphys' secret lab of horrors and do a couple of chain of events in order to activate the true pacifist ending. And then we find ourselves fighting Asgore again, only this time Toriel confronts Asgore and all the colourful characters of the game converge for a heartfelt show of camaraderie and friendship. Until Flowey gets involved. We find out it's been manipulating Papyrus and tried to get all of the human monster souls in one place to consume everyone's soul. And this is when Flowey turns into its true form. Asriel. Aw, oh, he's just a little goat kid. I mean, that doesn't look too harmful. I mean, he's not even got any weapons. This shouldn't be a problem. Ah. Yeah. This fight with Azriel is mainly a battle of survival as we just have to outlast his attacks and kill, and guess what? He turns into his true final form. Again. And in this one he's even more of a pain in the ass as we can't even move. However, in a similar fashion to our battle with Flowey, we call out for help and draw out the souls, this time of our lost friends. With that done, each soul rebels against Azrael and we find out more about his past. We try to save him as he resists. Until finally, as Azriel starts to burst into tears and gives up in the battle and reverts back to his innocent original form, Frisk, the main character, embraces Azriel and gives him a cuddle. And then, he returns the souls back to normal at the expense of his own true form. Well that was fun. I guess we're all done here. No, Triple G. You have just begun. Who said that? I am your true nature. I demand blood. But this is a game about pacifism. I mean, look how well I've done. Everything's peaceful. Everyone's happy. I've done everything right. Your true challenge is not yet fulfilled. Give in to your nature. Become genocide. Undyne, give up, you're no match for me. Oh, looky here, she's got some sort of final form. Good luck. Oh shit. Okay, I got her, let's continue. Ah, Metaton, you're also going to go into your own final form. Go on then, give it your best shot. Well, that was disappointing. Right, now it's time to kill the Coward King. No one can save him now. No one lives to tell the tale. No Sans. Stay back, idiot. Your puny little bones are no match for me.
So it turns out that Sans is in fact the most difficult opponent in the game to defeat. He not only has a bunch of really tricky attacks to dodge, but he also harms you when you navigate the menus, the bloody menus, and flits between attacks at a breakneck pace. Come on you cheeky Seriously, give up, you're only making it- Idiot, I'm full of determination. I won't give up, I won't- Wait, you, you're, you're letting me live? After all I've done? Oh, hey man, that's it, bring it in! Br bring it in! Yes! Take that, you boner! How does it feel? Oh, well, As Asgore, yeah, yeah, let's, let's kill Asgore and be done with this. Wait, wait a minute, you, you don't want to fight? Come on! Oh, that was easy. Huh? Flowey? I was waiting to kill him for you. After all, it's me, your best friend. I can help. Please don't kill me. <laughs> Greetings. I am Fuck. There is nothing left for us here. Let us erase this pointless world. Yes. Let's. Yeah. That's weird. Just on the home menu. What have I been doing for the last two weeks? I don't remember. Huh. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching this video, hope you guys enjoyed it. Before I end this, I just want to say that if you've heard any of the soundtrack stuff I used in this video, a lot of it's from the original game, which is probably the main reason I got into it, because I love the music. But I also included music by Toxic Eternity, a heavy metal guitarist on YouTube, and Richard E.B. and Ace Waters, who did a cover album of uh, Undertale called Determination, which was officially licensed by Toby Fox. And I'm going to put links to the respective videos. I'll put one of uh, Toxic Eternity's most recent Undertale remixes and the playlist for the Undertale Determination album. So if you enjoyed any of this review, a lot of it was bolstered by the music, and I think it's probably the biggest, you know, the biggest reason I got into the game before I even played it. Check these guys out because they're awesome. Uh, other than that, I don't know when the next video is going to be up in the normal fashion, but next month there is going to be a themed month. And I won't tell you what it is right now, but uh, stay tuned, I think you might enjoy it. Either way, thanks so much for watching this video, and I'll see you guys later.